Good evening, Castle Hill Baptist Church. It's great you can tune in again. Once again, it's been many, many weeks and many months, but it's great you can be here. Uh, also, a special, special warm welcome for all those who are tuning in who are not part of this congregation. We welcomely, uh, we uh, warmly welcome you to, to join in on this, and we trust that the uh, Lord's Word would really uh, bless you tonight. We're going to, as of tonight and the next few weeks, we're going to just take a little bit of a break from the study of Joshua um, as holidays are now approaching, and we're going to be looking at uh, just random passages. And so tonight uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 127, Psalm 127. So if you have your Bible, if you have your phone, please open it up to this chapter. It's nice, short and sweet, uh, but there's some wonderful things uh, for us to see in here. Psalm 127. It reads, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from him, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, a sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. He who has ears to hear, let him hear the word of the Lord. Please join me as we just pray and ask for God's gracious help and blessing upon our time. Our Father in heaven, you who are holy and above all things, we come before you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, we want to say thank you. Thank you that we have this opportunity, even as we're apart, to open up your word. Oh God, we ask your precious word that we have on our laps even now. May you cause us to see the wonders in it. Lord, as as your word is preached tonight, I pray that we would truly experience your word as a lamp to our feet and a light into our path. I pray you would be so working in us, the truths contained in here, Lord, that they would almost even revolutionize the way we look at our lives, the way we look at this world, and the way that we view you, O God. We thank you for your word. It's your special gift to us. And now we pray for the gift and blessing of sending the Holy Spirit to work and and take the word tonight and transform us. I pray that Christ will be magnified, that his church would be built up even tonight. And any who may be unbelieving, who have strayed or who are lost, I pray that they may come and fall at the feet of the great and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, we look at uh, Psalm 127, and really, uh, this is a, a psalm that deals with the two real main spheres of our lives, the work and the family, the home. So this, is, this psalm encompasses these things. You'll notice a little uh, scripture underneath, uh, underneath the title there. It says, The Song of Ascents. Now, these are a few psalms that have been collected together, and these really, uh, we believe that these were psalms uh, that the writers intended to be read and sung as, as the Jews made their way to the temple for worship. So really a similar uh, context would be if you've got a little bit of a way to travel to church Uh, On a Sunday, you're sitting in the car, and as you're driving to church with your family, you put on some Christian worship uh, songs, and you sing it together as a family. This is really what this how this psalm is supposed to function on the way to worship, uh, to sing it, and to be blessed by it. You'll also notice that the title says of Solomon. Now, uh, scholars, for really pointless reasons, try and debate whether this really is Solomon. It says there that it's of Solomon, so I think we should take it at face value that he is the author of this. So look at verse 1 as we uh, launch into this wonderful psalm. Verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Now, Solomon gives really two images that were very familiar to the ancient world, the image of building houses and watching over a city. 
Now, what's this image referring to, uh, the image of building, building a house or building the house? Well, really, it could be a few different things here. Uh, so it's best not to be too dogmatic. Remember, the author is Solomon. So he could be referring to the temple here because you'd remember uh, God had commanded not David to build the, t- the temple, but his son Solomon. And Solomon says here, unless the Lord builds the house, it's in vain. It could be a reference to the temple. Also, it could just simply be a reference to a physical house, a, a home. It could be a reference to building projects, uh, the activities of life, whatever we're creating and making. It also could be a re- reference to the household. When it says house there, it could be a reference to the family, uh, the household. So it starts, the household starts with marriage and eventually by God's grace is filled with children. It could be all three of these things encapsulated. I think it's helpful to view uh, this as the household because later on in the psalm, uh, Solomon begins to talk about children. But I think it, it, it could be labors, it could be the household, it could be any of these things. But notice the point here. He says uh, twice in verse 1, unless, unless the Lord, unless the Lord's in it, unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor in vain. And that word there, vain, in the first two verses is used three times. So there's two key things happening here. Unless the Lord, and also in vain. Unless the Lord, it's in vain. That's really the dominant thing here. It's pointless. It's useless. And now we know it's obvious our labors and efforts are in vain without God. True building, true successful building is a result of God's involvement and blessing upon our labors and upon our work. The problem is we are so prone to building and working without God. And this has been the work of humans from the beginning of history. Remember this idea to build without God. Uh, We see at the beginning of Genesis with the building of the Tower of Babel, They said, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. And the project was completely apart from God. And God came down and he confused their languages and the building came to a halt. And it ended up being nothing. See, we build, we create, we pursue so many things. But is God in it? With all our endeavors, with all our ambitions with everything that we try and start and put the plow to all of those things that we do is it to the glory of God is it for God's glory and is it energized by him all of our work all of our study if we take this to be a reference to the households and our families we see that our families our homes must be built by God do we do we really think about this I honestly think as we as Christians take this very, very lightly. So when we think about the home and the household, we seek marriage, we pursue marriage, and we might get a bit of brief premarital counseling. Then we have children, and then we might perhaps uh, read, read a book on marriage or read a book on parenting and then try and maybe take a few principles from it and then uh, send off our kids to a kid's ministry or a children's ministry. And as we have done that, then we uh, rub our hands, clap our hands together and say, tick, well done, that's it. Not so, not so. Our homes need to be built by God. We need our homes to be governed, directed by God and done and functioning according to the glory of God and His will. They need to be uh, functioning according to His influence. You see, we need to be uh, looking to the Word to see how He wants us uh, to raise our families and to, and to function as married spouses. You know, not many Christians actually act do this where they look at the word what is God's will for me as a parent what is his will for me as a husband study carefully look at the word and try to implement principles from scripture to the glory of God not many do this it is to talk with other godly Christians who've been married for a long time who've been parents talking to them asking them for help and for wisdom It is to pray to God, to ask, to seek, to knock, to ask for his help and to pray that he would be in all things. You see, it's not simply to do it our own way and then just ask God to bless it. No, no. God must be governing and directing. 
You see the second image that Solomon gives here in, in verse 1. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In the, in the ancient world, they didn't have advanced technological surveillance systems. They didn't have that. Rather, a city's security system was watchmen. Now, on the city walls, a watchman would, watchman would take shifts and they would walk along the city walls and the walls would be manned and walked along 24-7. When people were sleeping, the city walls were watched by these men and they needed to be vigilant, watchful, sober. Now, the word here, the Bible says, unless the Lord watches, watchmen are useless. They watch in vain. What's the point? This is watchmen are to protect, to preserve. They are a precautionary measure. Solomon saying, what precautions will benefit if God turns his face away? What good will all our watching be if God's not in it? Our watching is as effective as sleeping on the city walls if God is not presently there. And so we have to ask the question, is the Lord... Building our homes, building our households. Is he keeping watch over our households? Is he keeping watch over the city as the one who protects? Now, one of the, one of the toughest things about being a parent is the ongoing struggle to, to not worry about our children. This is, this is an ongoing struggle. To, to not worry about their safety, to not worry about their health, to not worry about their future, to not worry about what decisions they'll make, to not worry about who they'll be influenced and what paths they will take, whether they'll rebel. So much worry, so much fear, so much anxiety fills the hearts of parents. Why? Why is this? Because we have tried to be the watchmen of their lives alone. We've taken that responsibility and we've forgotten or neglected to commit them to the Lord. Think about this. Are you, being, are you trying to be the primary watchman of your children? Now here's a way to think about it, to work it out. Compare the amount of time you worry about your children with the amount of time you spend on your knees praying for them. Compare those two things. How does the Old Testament instruct us in these matters? Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. You know it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. What's the New Testament instruction for these matters? 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your anxieties upon him for he cares for you. Committing ourselves to the Lord So the application here, in our labors, in our work, in our tasks, in all that we put our hands to do for work, is God the one building? Is the Lord building our households? Is the Lord keeping watch over the cities? He keeping watch over our homes, over our children, over our lives? You see, this is not a call to passivity though, to be passive in the matter. God's word is to have a prominent place in our homes. His word is to do that. It's not a let go and let God thing. We need to make prayer in our homes as natural as breathing. The word must play a key role in this as well. Proverbs 6, 11 and 12. Look what it says about the word. This is the instruction. Bind it always on your heart. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk... They will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak with you. See, building and watching is not something that we're passive in. It's God working through us. It's His Word having a place. We're not passive in this matter. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15.10? But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all the apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see, the Lord building the house involves us building. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul even calls himself a builder. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 3.10. By the grace given to me, I laid a foundation like a skilled master builder. That's how he compared his labors in ministry. 
See, God must build. God must build. But we are his workmanship, the scriptures say. So Solomon is saying, the Lord must build the house. But but he's saying, builders are necessary. Watchmen are necessary. But the power, the success, the fruit comes from God. Again, Paul put it so beautifully. Look what he said in 1 Corinthians 3, 7. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants or the water or waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. And there's wonderful application here. If we see conversions through our ministry, if our homes begin to flourish, if our children become faithful, if our workplace and, and the efforts of our work is successful, we must be so careful not to intercept the praise that is due to God. We must not worship our own hands or our own giftedness. It belongs to Him. So we must work hard, God working through us. But again, This leads to danger. Hard work can lead to danger. And this leads to our next point here. Counsel to the workaholic. Counsel to the workaholic. Look at verse 2. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. You see, this is here the description of the workaholic. How are they portrayed? It says, they rise early and they stay up late. They work crazy, crazy, crazy hours. It's all consuming. Their life is summed up by work or study or tasks. Work is everything. Now, we must be careful. The Bible commends a hard work ethic. The Bible commends hard work, as we saw in Proverbs, as we saw with Paul. But here, we're confronted with a workaholic who barely stops, and the load of work they bear upon their own shoulders. It's not the Lord building. You see there at the end, uh, in verse 2, it says, toiling for food to eat. Now, the NIV isn't a great translation here, and it really misses the Hebrew. Look at how some of the other key translations uh, do it, uh, state it. The ESV, eating the bread of anxious toil. The NASB, eating the bread of painful labors. The New King James Version, eating the bread of sorrows. What's, he, what, what, what's, what's happening here? What's the imagery? This is the person who gets up at the crack of dawn and they stay up so late to keep on working and laboring. They're burning the midnight oil just to get their stuff done. And even when they do eat, They eat under duress. They eat under pressure. They eat with anxiety. They can't enjoy their food. They squeeze in their meals. Even to eat is not an enjoyable experience. I was reading an article uh, entitled Confessions of a Workaholic. And Ron Shear was writing and and he was talking here. and, And Ron, in this article, he writes this. Quote, the the workaholism issue is a real one for me. I'm never more than a couple of steps mentally from the computer. What keeps me tethered is the fear that if I stop, my whole world will come crashing in on me. It's hard to get out of that mindset for even a few minutes. See, even, even to eat, for Ron, it was the bread of anxious toil, even just eating And so do you see what comes out of this article? He feels as if he cannot, he's not able to leave the screen, leave his work task without his world crashing down. He is afraid and terrified of stepping away from his tasks and responsibilities. Why is that? Why why the fear? Because he doesn't entrust his work to God. The building and the watching is dependent upon him. And so the pressure weighs down and the hours crank out. His mindset is, I must build the house or it will fall. I must keep watch or the city will be invaded. This is this kind of work ethic, this kind of view of work. It is very, very dangerous. It's dangerous to a person. It's dangerous to a marriage. It's dangerous to a family. Let me quote Alan Ross as he highlights this. 
quote, a long and industrious day is not wrong. In fact, it is held up as profitable in wisdom literature. But if the fruit is produced through tiring labor, anxiety, and stress, then the family eats of the food so produced. How often does stress, work stress, and work problems affect the family? He keeps going. He says, It's a life of fear and worry without trusting the Lord and therefore is futile, vain. More than that, physically and emotionally, for such anxiety kills the body just as easily as it kills the spirit. See, such a work ethic, such a mindset of work is dangerous. You think you're building your household. You think you're watching everything, but you're actually destroying it. It's not just dangerous, it's in vain because the Lord's not in it. Solomon now, he shows us a better way. And what he says next is stunning. Stunning. Look at the last line of verse 2. He grants sleep to those he loves. See, here is the blessing of God to the anxious. He gives peace to those who labor sorrowfully. He comforts to those who are weary and worn out. He gives rest. He gives sleep. And it says there, it's so, so wonderful. He says, the Lord grants sleep to his beloved to his loved ones. Yes, God is the mighty builder. Yes, God is the all-seeing watcher, but he is also the lover, the great lover of his people. Isn't that a transcendent statement? Isn't it glorious? Every Christian is dearly loved by God. He loves us with an eternal love. Scripture says he loves us from before the creation of the world, before we even knew him. And Scripture also says he loves us with an everlasting love. He will love us unto forever. And he loves us with a sacrificial love. He gave us his own son, his only begotten son. We are deeply loved by him. And it says a special gift that God gives to his beloved is sleep. God prepares a special pillow for his children. Now this verse was very interesting to me and also difficult for me. And I needed to think about it for a while. I personally have struggled with sleep for many, many years. And I know some of you from this congregation do too. Uh, for me, I wake up continual, continuously through the night. My sleep is so broken. And even last year, it got so bad, some of you were praying for me. And yet, as I thought about this, and, and about this verse, how God gives sleep, though I wasn't getting as many hours of sleep as the next person, God had always prepared a pillow of peace for me. Always. God, God, made, God made bed for me a place of rest, solace, and peace of mind. And his sovereignty, his sovereignty was my pillow. Because when I lay down, I could entrust my family into his care. I could entrust the burdens of ministry to his care. I could entrust all of life into his care. And I, and I began to realize this. Solomon writes this, and his father, David, also wrote something of the same lines. Listen to what his father, David, wrote in Psalm 4, 8. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. See, to, to, to to the one who labors and who strives for the glory of God, to the one who works hard and commits their way to the Lord, to the one who entrusts the building to the Lord, to the one who entrusts the watching to the Lord, the Lord grants them rest. He grants them rest. And when a person entrusts the building and the watching to God, and goes to sleep having entrusted that to God, they actually glorify God. They glorify Him. Sleep actually becomes a demonstration of faith. It really does. Because you switch off when you sleep, and you leave it with God. 
You untether yourself from your work and you leave what you can't do for now into the Lord's hands. And so when we sleep, when we sleep, we, we go confidently to the pillow knowing that while we sleep, God is still working. Isn't that wonderful? And so if you entrust the building to God, if you entrust the watching to God, will he let everything crumble in your life like Ron in that article was worried about? Psalm 121 verse 3 to 4. Look at these words. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never slumber nor sleep. He grants us the gift of sleep. And he'll keep working because he never sleeps. Which leads to the last point that I really want to spend some time on here. This is the right perspective of the home the right perspective of the home. Look at verses 3 to 5. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gates. Now what is the connection between this section and the previous section? Well, Solomon has been addressing the key spheres of our life. We've seen the sphere of work, and now he addresses the sphere of family, children. Also, he has shown us that success in our labors is a gift from God. He has shown us that sleep from our labors is a gift from God. And now he's going to show us that children are a gift from God. Now, it says there in, in the verse, sons. And it makes an emphasis on sons as well as children, but on sons. And this is just because in the ancient world, sons played a key role. Uh, sons were big workers in the, in the house. They had a prominent role in the family. But mod, modern translation of these verses simply as children suffice. To, to look at these verses, children. It says, children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward from the Lord. Now, the same word here for heritage uh, is, is the word uh, uh, allotment, inheritance, and it often refers to the land that God gave Israel. Now, the land that God gave Israel was his special gift to them, and now he's using that same inheritance language saying that children are inheritance from the Lord. Children are God's love gift to us. They are given from him, and in just the same way as a wife is given from the Lord. God gave Adam Eve to be a wife as a gift. Marriage is God's gift, we see in Scripture, and children are God's gift. Now, Jacob, he understood this. He cheated his brother. He ran away. But after many years, he came back to seek the forgiveness of his brother Esau. Look what happens when he returns. Genesis 33 verse 5. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children, and he asked Jacob, Who are these with you? Jacob answered, These are the children God has graciously given me, your servant. Jacob knew that they were a gracious gift. Why am I laboring to make this point? Why, why, why am I talking about this? They are God's special gift, and God's design for marriage specifically and majorly involves children. It does, largely involves children. Genesis 1.28, God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. This is God's design, children. And yet the world devalues them. The world devalues the family unit. They teach us to put off children, palm off children and get into the workforce, boost the economy, liberate women from the oppression of having to stay at home and look after children, liberate that, them from that and let them go into the workforce. You see, this is such an important subject for Christians, childbearing and child raising. You see, when you look at the testimony of Scripture in regards to children, when you look at God's design for marriage, it has implications. It's not right. Hear me. It's not right for couples to get married without the intention of having children. Some, some might 
Some might get into marriage uh, considering having them, but to put them off as long as possible. Have them later in life. And, and have them later, have them after you build a house, after you've, you've settled for a long time in your career, after you've checked off your bucket list, after, after you've done all the traveling that your heart desires, after, when you're older. Why is it that this is the mindset even of Christians today? Why? Why are Christians thinking like this? Because for many Christians, they are more influenced by the world than the word. That's why, that's why there is this mentality that you should try and suck all the juice out of life first before having kids. To do everything, everything you want before having kids. Give your best years to self and then have a kid. Is that, is that, the, is that the Christian way? Verse 5, look at verse 5. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them full of children. You see, this is the Bible's testimony. Look at the Bible's testimony. You got a full house, that's a full blessing. That's that's massive blessing. Full house, major blessing from the Lord. Happy father, happy couple. How opposite, how opposite is what God esteems to what the world esteems. How 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 polar opposite. Even for example, when news started getting out that Brooke was pregnant again and people started finding out and they came up to us. I still remember on two distinct occasions, the first thing that came out of the person's mouth was, you guys are crazy. And then not long after, another person said that, you guys are crazy. And what makes it more astounding is this came from the mouth of Christians. God says, how blessed, how blessed. The world says, how cursed, how cursed. Now, why are children today not seen as this blessing? Why, why is that? Well, I think for two reasons. Children are lots of work, and therefore they require a lot of self-denial. You need to die to self daily when you have kids. And so people see it as the end of their lives. But secondly, why, why are kids not seen as a blessing? Because today so many children are undisciplined. Now, this is, a, this is a major issue. Too many psychologists have got into our ears and their opinions have been interpreted as more inspired than God's word. Too many PhDs have been written about parenting and they have trumped and overshadowed the influence and the reception of God's word on these matters. And what's the result been? Undisciplined children. We have a better way. We've worked out a better way of raising children. And what happens with undisciplined children? The home is wild. The house is chaotic. It makes the home a terror. And with wild, undisciplined children, it sucks all the joy, all the peace out of the home. You see, Scripture repeatedly warns of the consequences of neglecting the difficult duty of disciplining children. There's major consequences. Solomon says children are a heritage, a gift from God. And because they are gifts, that means we are now stewards of them. They are our stewardship, a responsibility. And the stewardship that we have for our children, children need to be nurtured. They need to be cared for. They need to be provided for. They need to be taught. They need to learn. They need to be trained up. They need to be instructed and led. Also, the Bible shows us that they are not permanent gifts, but they are temporary gifts. And, and they're t- because they're temporary, they're going to be released from us one day. And because they're temporary, and because we can't hang on to them long, we have a great burden and responsibility placed upon us to train them up, to train them up. Parents have this duty to train up their children, these gifts from God. You read through the Proverbs. It teaches the responsibility of disciplining your children, disciplining them so that you might shape their character. The responsibility of teaching them God's word, teaching them. Deuteronomy 6, morning and evening, teach and talk about God's word. When you go out, when you come home, when you rise, when you sleep, talk about God's word. Ephesians 6, fathers, bring up your children in the instruction and discipline 
of the Lord. Do this. And mothers, mothers, I appeal to you. Do not believe the lie. Do not believe the lie presented by the world that being a homemaker, that being a home mom is a lesser calling than having a secular job. Don't buy into that. Society esteems economy and industry and the workforce. God puts a great premium on the importance of the home. The ministry at home is vital. And so, because it's so vital, we desperately need God's help. Because this is so important, we desperately need the grace of God. I want you to think about this, parents, or you who may be parents one day. Think about it in this mindset, how much we need the grace of God, how much your children need the grace of God. Think about some of the most darkest times of your life. Some of the most perverse paths that you have gone down. Some of the deep, deepest and darkest secrets that you've tucked away of things that you have done. Perverse and evil things that you've gotten up to. Now understand this, parent or future parent. That same self-centeredness. That same rebellion, that same darkness, that same love of darkness and hatred of light resides in your children. They are children of Adam and they are sinners. And so because this is the case, we have such an important responsibility to show our children Christ, show them Christ daily, talk about Christ, point them to Christ. We have such a responsibility to teach them God's word, to teach them daily, to share it with them. We have such a responsibility to pray earnestly that God would have mercy and save them, that God would open their eyes, that they would receive Christ. We have such a, such a responsibility to bring them regularly to church, to the house of God, so they can see baptism, so they can see the Lord's Supper, so they, they can be part of the singing of the praises of God, so that they can sit under the preaching of God's word, so that they can be around other Christians. And most of all, parents, we need to be modeling before them in our homes a godly life, a life that is consumed with a passion for God to be glorified in all things. What a responsibility. And, and understand, this is, a tough, this is a tough duty. This is hard work. But this is truly the Lord building the house. And this is truly the Lord watching over the city. And there will be fruit. There will be fruit. Now, there's something here, a couple of things that we must clarify. Children are always a gift from God. Always a gift from God. Even if they turn out rebellious. And walk away. Let me quote Brian Borgman. Even the children that don't turn out the way you think they should. Even the ones that aren't manifesting the graces, the gifts you've tried to pour into them. Even the ones that are a little rebellious and the ones that are a lot rebellious. I will tell you, God does not nullify them as a gift. They're still a gift. If your children have gone astray... If they're wayward, they're still a gift from God. Don't lose heart. Keep praying for them. And may your greatest longing be that they come to know Christ and serve Him faithfully. Give their lives in devotion to Him. Keep praying and don't lose heart. On the other end, if your home is flourishing, if your family and children are flourishing, if your children are saved, be so careful. Do not intercept the praise that is due God. Give Him the glory. Do not take the credit. Worship Him. Give Him the thanks. Also, there's something else that we need to think about here. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. Now, there's something difficult here. Difficult here. We know that sometimes God chooses to close the womb. That sometimes Christians cannot have children. And, and we see sometimes that God grants children to wicked unbelievers. Well, His devoted followers... Can't have kids. Now we don't know why this happens. We don't, God doesn't tell us why this is the case. But one thing that we do know, 
We must stand upon Romans 8.28 that he is working all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. He has a plan and a reason why he's not, and it's for good. Children are a blessing for unbelievers and especially for believers to train them up, to teach them, to show them Christ. But let me, let me be so earnest here. If you cannot have a child, if you can't conceive, if you can't have kids, can I, can I ask you to even consider, consider fostering, consider adoption. I have some close friends who have done it. There's some dear friends in the church here who have done it, who have fostered. Would you even consider it to give, to, give, uh, to give a chance and to show love to those children that have been rejected, to give them an opportunity at receiving love and to give them an opportunity to be loved and to live life, to live it in safety, to live it in care, and also to give them an opportunity to be introduced to their creator God and the Savior Jesus Christ. Would you even consider that? And even if you do have children, one or many, may you even be open to the consideration of fostering a child, adopting a child, taking them in. Children are a blessing and a gift from God. I was reading an article from a news site and it said this, There's an urgent need for foster carers in Australia. In New South Wales alone, 660 foster carers are being sought this year to care for children who aren't safe living at home. So why the shortage of foster parents? This is a secular article. A secular writer is saying this. Christians, why why are there not more? Taking foster children, seeking adoption. What an opportunity to be blessed, but to be a blessing unto others. Paul said, what was the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? It is more blessed to give than to receive. And after all, isn't, isn't adoption one of the greatest gift that a Christian gets to experience, that every single Christian gets to experience, that God chose to set his love upon us who were far off, that God chose to have pity upon us, who were orphans, who were orphans, that he set his love upon us before we even knew him or knew about him, and that he, by his grace and love, brought us into his family. What does it say in Ephesians 1 verse 5? In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Adoption and fostering, what an opportunity to imitate our glorious God. And what an opportunity for evangelism to take these kids and spend a life feeding them the word of God and introducing them to Jesus. Solomon says children are a heritage and a blessing from the Lord. And you know how this is so true? Because the greatest blessing that ever came to humanity came through the giving of a child. What does it say in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6? For to us... A child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The greatest gift came through the giving of a child, the receiving of a child. Well, there's so much more here, even in verse 5 that I haven't got to reach. It talks about more blessings that children bring. But I'll just wrap up here. What a Psalm 107, what a wonderful, what a wonderful psalm. It touches on the two key spheres of our lives, work and family. Work and family. And we see it's all about Him. It's all for Him. Let me pray. Our Father, we come before You and we just thank You uh, for Your Word. 
God, I pray these things that we see here, Lord, the way that we live our lives, the way that we work, the way that we labor, the way that we function in our marriages, the way that we parent, the way that we view our lives, the way that we we view the gift of children, the way that we raise children, the way that we, uh, Lord, run our lives daily, our homes daily. God, help us to see it in light of your word that we would be committed to seeing you and have you build our homes. You keep watch over the city. You taking control and us entrusting our sleep into your hands and us receiving children, fostering children, adopting children, taking children as a blessing and pouring our lives into training them up in your ways. Oh God, oh God, by your spirit, take these wonderful truths And Lord, saturate our hearts with them. Grip us, take hold of us. I pray that we would not merely hear this message and then walk away. But God, I pray for transformed lives. Change everything, change everything, oh God. We ask, oh, may you be glorified and may we live our lives according to your word so that Christ may be honored, that he might be lifted up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. Amen. Amen.